ask you to join me in considering a very simple, maybe even obvious, but yet profound idea. We are bodies in space. Now this simple idea has sent me on a quest most of my life to try and understand the interrelationship between inside space, outside space, and body space. And I've done this by looking through three lenses, knowledge systems, culture systems, and brain systems. And I'm going to admit today on the subject of brain systems that I'm very curious about the recent controversy over whether or not online games are good or bad for our brains, especially when it comes to spatial intelligence. Now, today I want to put before you a study that basically dealt with comparing games. Then the stunning results have given pause to neuroscientists and the brain game com uh, in industry that otherwise is interested in developing games for clinical rehabilitation, education, and as well, home use. Now the games were given to 77 undergrads, randomly assigned, and as you see, they were given games that pit a narrative game versus a brain game. The study was conducted in 2014 by the shoot team at University of me, Florida State, and they found, came up with some very curious results. By the way, who here is a Portal 2 player? Okay. How about Lumosity players? Who play both? Fascinating. Who play neither? Please raise your hand. Yes, okay, well then let me share with you the fact that Portal 2 is an online game. It's a narrative-based game steeped in a sci-fi narrative of chase and escape. It's developed by Valve Corporation. Very popular, despite the show of hands in this audience. And Lumosity, you probably have heard advertised on NPR. Uh, it's a game that is designed, a series of games that are designed to challenge memory, attention, and problem solving. The students were given standard cognitive tests before and after playing these games, and the games were only played for eight hours, not a really robust study by any stretch of the imagination, but telling them the least. And lo and behold, it turns out that Portal 2 players trumped the brain game players of Lumosity. Now you can imagine the chagrin and perhaps the skepticism of neuroscientists who have put their, line, their, their careers and their money on the line to develop games that are good for our brain. And rightly so, after all, if a media entertainment company can actually design a game that boosts cognitive development and keeps us interested for hours on end, then perhaps they should be designing the brain games, or at least neuroscientists could take some tips. And that's exactly what's been happening in the new partnership that's developed between neuroscientists, game designers, and wearable tech industry leaders to design games that are fun to play and good for our brain. Now, what does this mean for actually spatial intelligence, because it's very curious that spatial intelligence was one of the cognitive development areas that were tested by the Florida State team. In my experience designing uh, design science camps for youth and for adults, I've had the good fortune of working with neuroscientists, and I've asked them this question, what is it about spatial memory and spatial intelligence and spatial learning that is so important for cognitive development tests and particularly has come of interest to the brain-mind research community. I'm sitting with Dr. Michael Merzarek, who's a pioneer in neuroplasticity research 
and also leads a company called Closet Science, which develops brain games. And he said to me, before I went out on an audience stage like this, tell them that we hang our memories on the curtain of space and time. Now, what does he mean by this? Well, it turns out that if you look at the spatial memory research, you're gonna find out that spatial navigation develops new memory, it grows brain tissue, and it plays a major role in integrating problem solving. Sounds like a good deal to me. Yeah. How do scientists know this? It seems that they have a very specific research tool they've used to figure out spatial navigation. And the bottom maze that you see is called a radial maze. It's used for stimulus response studies, a rat put into the wheel and actually asked to find cheese, kind of like the way we search for the great bakery following the smell. Yeah. The, the top above is? is actually called the Morris Water Maze. Now this was an innovation in spatial navigation research, which had been gone on for really over 50 years and is being boosted by neuroscience. And this tub is filled with cold water, the platform is submerged, and the little rats who are the subjects have to find their way onto the platform. Now this maze is an innovation in wayfinding studies, and it took advantage of two things. First, rats don't like swimming in cold water. <laughs> and second, they are very anxious when they're actually put into empty space on uncertain territory. Scientists have a great word for this, thigmotaxis. Thank you, ancient Greeks and Latin, for making this a very hard word to say. It is thigmotaxis. What does it mean? It means you're a wall hugger. Okay? How many people here hug walls? How many people put your bed next to a wall? How many people sleep in the center of the room? Aha. Okay, so keep this in mind because if you were a subject in the motion and memory lab that's run by Dr. Veronique Bobot at McGill University, you might discover something interesting about the way you spatially navigate. Here is an example of Dr. Bobot's game design that's designed in Unity and takes advantage of the water, uh, the water wheel that actually is looking for wayfinding, as well as the radio maze. And Dr. Bobot is an advisor to my institute, and she and I have developed knowledge transfer activities together to understand how to communicate spatial navigation to people. But in these tests, she's found something very interesting about spatial wayfinding. It turns out that there is a distinction between whether you're using wayfinding, in other words, trying to find your way home by using markers like lights, color, shapes, or whether or not you use a response strategy, which is simply you've memorized something, it's gone into autopilot, and you can just do it through memory, like the way we brush our teeth, the way we drive our car, we don't think about it very much but we somehow can navigate our way through space. So she's discovered that there is a neural distinction between when we wayfind, hippocampus, and when we actually use a response strategy which is gonna be calling on the caudate nucleus. Now, you've heard the word hippocampus earlier today by Dr. Wendy, and yes, it's key for long-term memory, but also it's very key for developing new memories, specifically spatial location memories, episodic memory, in other words, imagining your bedroom and experiences you've had when you were a child, or coming to a space that reminds you of the breakup or the first time you fell in love. The hippocampus, which has been cited for neurogenesis, it was one of the first areas cited for neurogenesis, the creating of new nerve cells, and also has been targeted as the first area that shows signs of onset of Alzheimer's. This is particularly important to understand that the hippocampus is central in its development, made possible through spatial navigation. By comparison, 
The caudate nucleus is an area of what's called the basal ganglia or the striatum. It's very close to the hippocampus region, and yet it, does a, it provides a very different function. What is that function? It seems that it gets recruited when we go into autopilot. It's used for habitual learning. It's used for procedural motor learning. So in other words, the rats that are trying to find their way to cheese will probably recruit caudate nucleus regions as opposed to when they're in the Morris water maze, they'll more likely recruit the actual hippocampus section. Now, Dr. Bobot put out a study this year that looks specifically at caudate nucleus in action games. And she found that caudate nucleus, more than hippocampus, is used for the, the needed response in action games, like the kind that you would use if you would play Call of Duty versus Sims. <laughs> so it turns out that Dr. Dr. Bobot's research reinforces studies done by Dr. Daphne Balbaillet at the University of Geneva, and she has been looking specifically at visual spatial acuity. She's been looking specifically at task switching. And so what we find here is that the reward systems that are in Call of Duty are going to be calling the caudate nucleus region versus the hippocampal region. So what does this mean for us? And what does this mean for the question of designing better games for better brains? And what does this mean for trying to make sense of all these different studies? Let's stop and think back on the Portal 2 study. We learned that the Portal 2 trumped the actual brain game because it was narrative. Okay? The narrative seemed to make a difference in all the scores of persistence and problem solving and spatial skills. And then we've learned that spatial wayfinding is actually key to growing new memory in the hippocampal region. And then we've also learned that the response strategy is key for autopilot used in basic, basic games of action. And this is going to get more complicated, gang, with VR and AR coming down the path, right? What is it going to mean when we actually, for those, any English players? OK. So no English players, which is uh, put out first by Google. It's a kind of a geocaching capture the flag game. And a uh, pretty beautiful imagery online. You can download it after this talk. Now, that's an AR game. So it means that you're basically working with your phone, and you're also looking for cool stuff in, this, in your own city. And then, of course, we have Oculus Rift, the Samsung, the Google Card Box. These are coming. These are coming, and are we ready for them? Not in the research sense. No, in fact, we really don't even have enough research to show how important they are, though neuroscientists are actively seeking these relationships right, to develop new games that make sense of VR spatial experience. So what does that mean for us in this room? Well, I say that it's really enough for us to remember that we're bodies in space. And that for those of us who are very interested in exploration of new worlds, that spatial navigation is mother's milk to creating new memories, to creating new brain tissue, and to creating new game worlds. Thank you so much.